Hello, uh, on behalf of the Biochemical Society and Portland Press, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's webinar, which is part of our dedicated biochemistry focus ECR webinar series. Topics in this series include different research areas in the molecular biosciences, as well as practical sessions to support career development. Each webinar will give you the opportunity to ask questions via text, and we welcome suggestions for future topics and speakers to feature in our webinar series. So please see the website for more details. My name is Dominika Gruszka. I am the Early Career Member Representative Trustee uh, and Chair of the Early Career Advisory Panel of the Biochemical Society. I am also a postdoctoral training fellow at the Francis Crick Institute in London, where I use single molecule techniques to study the molecular mechanisms of DNA replication and chromatin maintenance. Today's webinar is titled Biochemistry One Molecule at a Time and is part of our dedicated early career research program of webinars. So before introducing the topic of this session, uh, I would like to thank PicoQuant for sponsoring this webinar. PicoQuant is a company which has been growing organically together with the single molecule community uh, for the last 25 years. Their MicroTime 200 confocal microscopy platform is considered to be the most open, commercially available system with trusted quality for time-resolved single molecule FLIM and FCS applications. Please see their website for more information. And now, before introducing our invited speakers, I would like to play a short introductory video from Pico Quant. So as previously mentioned, uh, today's webinar is titled Biochemistry One Molecule at a Time uh, and it's linked to a special issue with the same title published in Essays in Biochemistry earlier this year. Conventional biochemical approaches for studying the action of molecules operate on a population level, averaging out any inhomogeneities within the ensemble. By contrast, investigating one biological macromolecule at a time allows researchers to directly probe individual behaviors and thus characterize the intrinsic molecular heterogeneity of the system. Consequently, single molecule methods have unraveled unexpected modes of actions for many seemingly well-characterized biomolecules and often proved instrumental in understanding the intricate mechanistic basis of biological processes. This issue of essays in biochemistry showcases different types of single molecule techniques and their applications to investigate processes that are fundamental to life. This is also the first issue written and then edited entirely by early career researchers who helped drive this exciting field of research forward. Today, we will welcome three authors from this issue who will provide a sampling of current experimentation using single molecule techniques and the applications of these methods to a range of biochemical problems. So the three speakers today are George Cameron from the Francis Crick Institute in London, Dr. Sonia Schmidt from Wageningen University in the Netherlands, and Dr. Peter Heidesen from the University of Iceland. Coinciding with this webinar, we have made their articles freely available to read from 8 until the 12th of November, so please visit the website if you're interested in reading their full articles, and I strongly encourage you to do so. Uh, and in fact, George's article is already open access, so you can read it whenever you wish. So before we start, uh, just a short housekeeping note. Questions will be asked after all the speakers' presentations, uh, but you can send in your questions during the talks. So if you have a question, please type it in the question box as shown in the image on the screen, and we will try to answer as many of the questions as possible at the end of the webinar. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to now introduce the first speaker of the session, George Cameron. Uh, George obtained his bachelor degree in natural sciences from the University 
University of Cambridge, uh, followed by a master's degree in biochemistry, also from Cambridge. Currently, George is the final year PhD student in Hassan Yardimshi's lab at the Francis Crick Institute, where he is studying mechanisms of eukaryotic DNA replication with single molecule techniques. Today, George will show us what happens when the eukaryotic replisome collides with protein barriers. So, all good, George, so I think you can start. Thanks, Dominica. So, I'd first like to um, introduce to you the mechanism of eukaryotic DNA replication. Um, so, billions of base pairs of DNA have to be replicated in uh, eukaryotes, and to replicate this large amount of DNA, replication initiates from multiple origins of replication. Um, the enzyme at the core of the replication reaction is this MCM27 um, protein and complex, and um, it is loaded onto double-stranded DNA as an inactive double hexamer um, in a process known as origin licensing. Um, later in the cell cycle, um, CDC45 and GINS proteins are recruited to MCM27, and this leads to origin firing. Double hexamers are remodeled around single-stranded DNA into the CMG complex at this point, and CMG unwinds DNA. Other um, replosome components are assembled around CMG. During replication, some double hexamers fire whilst others are not used, um, and the consequence of CMG enzymes encountering double hexamers during replication is not um, really very clear. Um, but because these collisions between CMG and double hexamers um, occur somewhat randomly in space and time, single molecule fluorescence microscopy is a useful tool for determining the consequences of these collisions. We can think about um, possible consequences of um, CMG colliding with double hexamers. Um, so in um, reconstituted yeast replication reactions, there's evidence that double hexamers slide ahead of CMG. Um, and it's possible that these provide new um, uh, origins for firing if the CMG at a replication fork encounters problems. Alternatively, in cells, additional factors might be present, um, which uh, result in the removal of double hexamers ahead of CMG. Um, and this could ensure um, unhindered progression of the replosome and CMG through chromatin during replication. So to replicate DNA in vitro in our lab, we use a system of two cell-free extracts from Xenopus eggs. And these extracts contain all of the necessary machinery for a single synchronized round of DNA replication. We can add DNA to the first extract, HSS, to license DNA, and this occurs in a sequence independent manner, so double hexamers can be loaded on a range of DNA templates. Adding geminin to HSS um, inhibits uh, origin licensing. Adding a second extract, MPE, to uh, license DNA uh, gives origin firing and replication. In NPE, no further origin licensing occurs, and we can also add this protein P27 to stop new origin firing. So we've got a good control of the amount of origin licensing and firing with these two extracts. Uh, previous work has used egg extract to replicate a 50,000 base pair lambda DNA that's tethered to the surface of a glass slide at both ends. Um, and this is visualized with total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy. The DNA is contained inside a microfluidic flow channel uh, to which extracts can be infused and uh, buffers as well. And here's a single, um, here's a single uh, labeled uh, lambda DNA with uh, DNA stain uh, visualized by turf microscopy. After tethering the DNAs, uh, we can add the extract to licensed DNAs with double hexamers and then a replication mix to um, give origin firing. We'd also add a second replication mix containing the um, inhibitor P27 kit to pro uh, prevent further origin firing. And in these replication mixes, um, we add a labeled version of the lagging strand processing enzyme FEN1. So um, as replication um, progresses, uh, FEN1 binds to the nascent DNA, um, as shown in this movie. 
Um, and if you're not familiar with a chymogram, below the movie is a chymogram, which is a stack of these images in time with the first time point at the top. And you can clearly see here the growth of a bubble of uh, FEN1 binding to the nascent DNA. Um, in this existing system, however, um, because the double hexamers and CMG are not directly labeled, we can't look at the consequence of CMG collisions with double hexamers. So I've adapted this system to uh, label MCM3 with a fluorophore. To do this, I immunodepleted endogenous MCM complexes and replaced them with complexes containing recombinant fluorescently labeled MCM3. So after licensing with the fluorescently labeled MCM3, um, I did a high salt wash to uh, remove any um, un improperly loaded MCMs from the DNA. And you can see a long DNA is in a field of view, um, fluorescent MCMs coating these DNAs. And if we do the same reaction in the presence of geminin, you don't see the same um, loading of um, the MCMs from the DNA, suggesting that um, we're seeing specific loading of the fluorescent protein by the licensing machinery. We can also look at fluorescence intensity traces for the um, for the uh, fluorescently labelled MCMs on DNA, um, and in many cases we see two step photo bleaching, like here um, and in the top right-hand corner as well. Um, we can see proper double hexamation, double hexamer formation has occurred from the photo bleaching. Two step photo um, So, the license DNA is a replication mixture containing labels than one uh, can be added to trigger or firing. Um, and we take images every minute to uh, make movies. And a chymogram is also shown below. So, here's a nice example where we see a single origin firing um, and this double hexamer splitting into two CMG molecules which move in or opposite directions whilst I'm winding DNA. And the labelled FAN1 uh, binds the nascent DNA between. Replication forks with labelled CMG move um, at around 400 base pairs per minute on average, uh, which is consistent with previously published work. And this suggests that the uh, labelling of MCM3 doesn't interfere with the uh, function of CMG in the replosome. One possibility um, I wanted to exclude from these assays was that actually um, an unlabeled CMG was pushing labeled double hexamers um, at the replication forks. And to do this, we can use known details of the replication termination reaction. So normally when CMG molecules converge during replication termination, they are removed in a pathway involving the P97 enzyme. But if we perform the same reactions in the presence of P97 inhibitor, CMGs remain on the DNA after convergence and termination. If we imagine the same reactions occurring but with an unlabeled CMG at a replication fork, after convergence and termination in the presence of inhibitor, only one CMG will uh, be seen to be labeled on the DNA after termination. So I performed single molecule replication reactions, um, in this case with more origin firing and uh, P97 inhibitor. Um, to look at what happens at termination. You can see here that um, two CMG enzymes approach one another and, one another, um, and remain on DNA after termination, um, suggesting that there isn't unlabeled DNA at replication forks. So I next started to look at collisions between CMG and double hexamers. I observed three different primary events occurring. Um, in this first example, um, we see double hexamer removal occurring. So when CMGs in both directions collide with a double hexamer, um, you see um, loss of double hexamer from the DNA. A second type of event we see is um, double hexamer stalling. Um, so again, labeled CMGs moving in both directions here um, collide with double hexamers and remain in the same position. Um, so we call this event um, fork stalling. And the third event we see is double hexamer sliding ahead of the replication fork. So in this example, a labelled replication fork on the right, sorry, an unlabeled replication fork moving on the right-hand side 
collides with a labelled double hexama, and then after this collision, the fluorophore continues to move the replication force, suggesting that the double hexama is being pushed ahead of the replicate. If I count many of these uh, events, I see that double hexa removal ahead of replication force is the dominant primary event occurring. It is possible that events interpreted as removal are in fact new origin firing events ahead of CMG. Um, and this is the reason we see so much uh, removal. Another control experiment that was important to do was imaging MCM complexes that have been labeled with a second color. Um, and this would allow any new origin firing occurring to be observed as now, instead of a magenta at the CMG moving at the rightward moving fork, it would be replaced with a green labeled CMG. So I licensed DNA with two colors of double hexamers and observed replication. Um, in this example on the left hand side, you see um, magenta CMGs in both directions colliding with a green double hexamer and giving removal of these. Whereas on the right hand side, a green um, CMG collides with a magenta double hexamer and this is removed. So together, these results suggest new origin firing is occurring ahead of CMG and that removal is the most common fate of double hexamers. Um, when collided by CMG. In reconstituted yeast replication reactions, double hexamers slide ahead of CMG. So an additional factor must be present in extract that um, results in an assist double hexamer removal. Some recent evidence has suggested that an accessory helicase, um, which acts on the opposite side of the fork to CMG, uh, might aid double hexamer removal. In egg extract, I'm particularly interested in these two helicases, RTEL1 and FANCJ. To investigate a role for these helicases, they can be immunodepleted from the replication mix. So this Western block just shows that uh, with antibodies, I'm able to deplete um, more than 95% of both the RTEL1 and the FANCJ enzymes um, from the same extract. If we look at the fate now of double hexamers when either RTL1 or FANCJ are removed individually from extract, the mild reduction in the proportion of double hexamers removed ahead of replication for. However, when we deplete these enzymes together, um, double hexamers are removed far less efficiently ahead of CMG. I'd just like to say, though, that this data is still fairly preliminary, um, as it's important to show that. Um, what we're seeing is a specific effect of depleting uh, these enzymes. So I'm in, now in the process of using recombinant RTL1 and FANCJ to test if defects in double hex removal can be rescued. So I hope um, in this brief presentation, I've been able to uh, show you how I've developed a system to visualize single MCM27 molecules during replication in real time. Um, and I've used this system to visualize CMG collisions with double hexamers. Um, and shown that double hexamers are mostly removed. Um, I finally showed some data showing that uh, perhaps two accessory helicases are involved in removing double hexamers ahead of um, CMG and egg extract. So I'd like to thank um, my supervisor and other colleagues um, in uh, the Odimchi lab for help with the project and also the Crick Science and Technology platforms uh, for many parts of the project. So thanks very much for listening. Excellent. Thank you very much, George, uh, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, and now I would like to introduce our second speaker today, um, Dr. Sonia Schmidt, an assistant professor at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Sonia studied nanosciences uh, at Basel University and earned her PhD in 2017 from TU Munich, uh, where she developed single molecule fluorescence threat experiments, invented SMACs, a direct pattern recognition approach to infer single molecule kinetics, and uncovered diverse regulatory effects of protein conformational dynamics. Sonia was awarded an SNF postdoc mobility fellowship and joined Case Decker's lab at TU Delft, uh, where she developed a new nanopore-based approach to detect protein dynamics called the NEO-TRAP. 
Sonia initiated and now leads the KinSoft Challenge, an international multi-laboratory benchmark study on single molecule kinetics software. Since 2021, 22, sorry, 2020, she's been a, a uh, an elected member of the advisory board of the international threat community and in 2021 excitingly she set up her nanodynamics lab at Wageningen University and research to develop new optical and electrical single molecule techniques to study biomolecular dynamics beyond current detection limit and now Sonia will tell us about nanopores and I believe she will answer the question that she posed in her article in essays which states and I quote so why as a protein fan should you care about nanopores uh, so thank you very much, Sonia. And yes, I can see your slide, so I think we're good to go. That is kind introduction. Uh, now I think I'm unmuted. Yeah, <laughs> thank you very, uh, very much. Um, also for giving me the opportunity to present uh, um, our work here. Um, indeed, my uh, presentation is entitled uh, Nanopores, a versatile tool to study protein dynamics. And as you can guess already from the title and from this slide, indeed, I'm quite uh, interested myself in studying proteins and uh, protein dynamics in particular. And uh, yeah, as you already heard a bit in the introduction, we do this in uh, my newly minted nanodynamics lab, uh, mainly with two uh, favorite techniques. One is single molecule FRET and fluorescence, and the other one is uh, nanopore uh, detection. And uh, in this talk, indeed, I will focus on the second part on nanopores. Um, so what are nanopores? Um, at the basis, nanopores are very simple detectors. They consist of an insulating membrane with a tiny hole uh, inside, as the name implies. Uh, this uh, insulating membrane with a hole uh, is immersed in a buffer solution. Um, and uh, if you apply uh, a bias across that uh, membrane, you can measure uh, an ionic current. Now, whenever uh, an analyte molecule, here we go, whenever an, an analyte molecule uh, comes close to this uh, pore um, or translo translocates uh, through that pore, it partially blocks that ionic current. And this leads to these uh, um, translocation events uh, with a certain blockade depth. So current blockade depth and a certain event duration. And there may be some more fluctuations in, in uh, these events. Now, all of these uh, observations are uh, protein characteristics, uh, characteristic which make, make them uh, interesting uh, for studying proteins. Now there's one uh, big challenge, and this is that in the most simple translocation experiments, your observation time of one single protein is very short. I mentioned here about the milliseconds, that would be true for protein pores, for uh, solid state uh, nanopores it's even shorter, more in the microsecond range. So um, one challenge I said was how to extend that uh, observation. No, okay. I don't see the right hand side of my screen, but fine. Um, so I, I will present to you in this talk uh, several uh, examples where uh, people found ways to extend this observation time uh, and uh, to, to, to much longer than uh, seconds. And that is particularly uh, useful for studying protein dynamics. Um, but first, one more slide on, nan one more slide on nanopores. So uh, nanopores can roughly be categorized into solid state nanopores and biological nanopores. On the solid state side, uh, we have different uh, types. Um, you can use uh, nanopipettes that are really pulled with the pipette puller until uh, they feature just a very tiny uh, nanometer sized uh, hole. Nanopores can also come on chips uh, in the most common case with the silicon nitride membrane and oftentimes drilled with a transmission electron microscope actually where you can really drill a hole into this membrane uh, and then there's no end to towards all kinds of more sophisticated um, nanofabricated uh, pores uh, including 2d materials as uh, where the membrane really consists of an atomic uh, or, or a single molecular uh, layer like here I think it was from a um, publication on uh, MOS2. Um, on the biological side we have uh, natural uh, 
protein pores that incorporate into a lipid uh, membrane. These can, of course, be engineered uh, by mutations to actually tune their sensing uh, capabilities. And uh, in addition, people also uh, uh, engineer by now nanopores using DNA origami, for example, also using uh, peptides. Then, uh, yeah, to detect um, actual nanopore signals, we need a setup. And uh, in the roughly all, yeah, the, the basic case is that uh, they consist of a flow cell with two buffer reservoirs, where in between here you would sandwich your, your nanopore, be it a biological nanopore incorporated into a lipid bilayer as an insulating layer, or be it a, a solid state nanopore. Uh, in both cases, um, there are um, two electrodes on either side of this membrane and uh, amplifier and the digi digitizer are used to then read out these currents and process them on a, on a PC. There are also uh, by now much uh, smaller implementations of, of such amplifiers and uh, Oxford Nanopore also developed uh, yeah, other small handheld uh, devices for Nanopore experiments. Um, with this, I will come now to a few um, applications of uh, nanopore technology, specifically to uh, protein science and uh, to detect uh, uh, protein functional uh, mechanisms. And uh, let's start uh, with uh, this famous experiment uh, out of uh, Gundlach's lab, um, where they can really sense how an, a helicase, a single helicase uh, uh, DNA processing protein uh, reels in a DNA single strand through such a, a nanopore. This DNA gets anchored in this uh, nanopore because of its negative charge. So there's a pulling force down, pulling force downwards uh, in the slide and the helicase reels in now this DNA which allowed um, Grundlach and co-workers to really resolve the half base pair steps of this helicase. And of course, this was uh, a big breakthrough and uh, enabled also uh, later on uh, DNA sequencing, which is now commercialized uh, by Oxford Nanopore Technologies. And actually this year, uh, there was another break breakthrough, I think it's fair to call it that way. Uh, um, just recently, uh, two labs managed to uh, sense peptide sequences for the first time in this uh, uh, using or building upon this approach. So basically what they did is they used a similar uh, approach with a DNA processing motor protein and uh, hook, hooked up this peptide sequence here uh, to the uh, DNA uh, strand. And um, now the DNA processing motor still processes that DNA piece, but at some point it reels in also the, um, the peptide, and this peptide sequence can be read. And in, in this uh, second um, uh, paper um, by Brinkerhoff et al., they even managed to uh, create a situation where um, uh, repeatedly uh, the sequence can be read over and over again, which of course increases a lot the uh, peptide sequencing accuracy. Another um, example, uh, which has nothing to do now with any kind of sequencing, is from the Giovanni Malia lab, where they managed to trap a DHFR protein, the hydrofolate reductase, in a protein nanopore, really inside, and they can actually detect the functional cycle of this enzyme, how it processes folate, um, uh, and they, they can really detect uh, actually up to five uh, different states and how they uh, uh, process like how they are timed and, and all of that. Another example is the one of transient binding. I mean, all of that is uh, detected uh, in a labor-free way. Uh, here, um, Kaku Redal um, added a, a varnase a binding moiety to a protein nanopore sensor, and they can now detect the transient binding of this bar, bar star domain to, uh, to varnase. And um, as you can see in a, a very nice way, gives these super nice uh, two-state um, signatures. Um, I find also this a uh, very nice example. Then in the end uh, of my talk, I uh, dare to plug in some slides on our newest uh, um, paper, which is on the nanopore electrosmotic trap that I did uh, as a postdoc in Case Decker's lab. 
uh, how does this work? So here a DNA origami ball is used um, to induce electroosmotic flows to trap a protein in the um, most sensitive region of a solid state nanopore. Um, this gives us this uh, nice three-step blockade. We can then hold such a protein um, for very long time, so for seconds to minutes actually. Um, and uh, we did this for several other proteins. So you see here always some uh, some current snippets uh, with these uh, three levels. Then sometimes uh, more levels, even if there's uh, um, some protein dynamics going on. And when we plot the main blockades of the protein itself um, versus molecular weight, we find this uh, linear behavior, uh, which also lets us, of course, uh, um, distinguish these proteins. And, um, and the asymmetry of this clip X protein, which is disc-like, uh, led to a second uh, peak for two uh, for the two different orientations. Uh, with this technique, we could also already um, show different or, or distinguish different conformations of one and the same protein in a nucleotide-dependent way. Uh, so this is HSP90, uh, which uh, occurs naturally in in a a conformational ensemble in, in an open V-shaped um, uh, way, but also in a more complex state, in particular if it is bound to uh, AMP, PMP, whereas the structural compaction uh, is lost um, towards ATP, ADP, and in the APO case, it's really a very floppy uh, uh, homodimer, by the way. Um, and with these uh, NeoTrap recordings, we managed to uh, detect uh, the different events and uh, taking a histogram of many such events, we see a very clear shift from this compact state towards um, much more um, heterogeneous um, uh, currents that we read. So this is, uh, as far as we know, the first uh, uh, labor-free detection in solution of, of these conformational uh, dynamics. Okay, with this I come to my summary. Um, I try to briefly introduce to you the very basics of nanopore uh, technology. Um, Protein-dependent signals can be uh, detected in a labor-free way. There are many diverse types of nanopores. It's uh, really difficult to squeeze this in such a short talk. Uh, I try to um, briefly highlight a few of my favorite uh, applications of uh, nanopore uh, technology. And uh, I ended up showing you our newest work, which is on the uh, new trap. And uh, with this, I come to my acknowledgments um, for the work I showed here, uh, of Chris Decker's uh, lab and, and Hendrik Dietz and Pierre Stürmer were our collaborators. So these were the most important people for, for the work I showed here. Um, this is my newly minted uh, small uh, of the group uh, with whom I work now. And uh, I'm happy to take your questions at the very end of this webinar. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Sonia. Uh, and our final speaker today is Dr. Peter Heidesen. Uh, Peter received his uh, BSc and MSc degrees in biochemistry from the University of Iceland, uh, where he studied the link between enzyme kinetics and flexibility. For his PhD studies, he joined the Structural Biology and NMR labor Laboratory at the University of Copenhagen, where he used NMR spectroscopy and single molecule optical tweezers to study the protein folding problem. Peter then got involved in a collaborative project between Copenhagen and Cambridge universities, uh, looking at protein misfolding and chaperone action. Subsequently, he studied intrinsically disordered protein complexes with single molecule spectroscopy in Ben Schuller's lab at the University of Zurich. In 2019, Peter joined the Department of Biochemistry at the University of Iceland as associate professor, uh, where his re research focuses on using single molecule techniques to study the interactions of transcription factors and chromatin. Uh, and today, Peter will tell us about disordered protein interactions studied with single molecule FRET. Thank you, Dominika. Yes. Yes. You can hear me and see me, I hope. Uh, and thank you so much for the for the invitation and uh, to the Biochemical Society for including me in this in this webinar. Um, so let me just see if I can get a pointer here. 
Yeah, so what I want to tell you about today is uh, how we can use single molecule spectroscopy to study the interactions between uh, disordered proteins. And so disordered proteins are quite common actually, and, and, in, and especially in the human proteome, we have a sort of a continuum of protein structures. So I took this picture from a recent review from uh, Julie Foreman K groups uh, group. And, um, and so most proteins, actually 58%, contain both folded domains and intrinsically disordered regions. And, and um, sort of the proteins that we have been very interested in are DNA and RNA binding proteins. And they tend to cluster towards the right side of this picture. So they tend to be more disordered than, than the, the general population of, of proteins. And because it is really a major challenge to study intrinsically disordered proteins uh, using classical ensemble uh, methods, we, we really need an alternative approach. And so single molecule spectroscopy is a really powerful technique to study such proteins. And I, I really, I just want to tell you a little bit what that's about. So here we have a protein that we've labeled with a donor and an acceptor fluorophore. And so we can excite the donor fluorophore and then either of two things can happen. So either the donor can emit a fluorescence photon or it could transfer its energy to the nearby acceptor and then the acceptor can uh, emit the fluorescence photon of a different wavelength. And really the strength of this method comes from the fact that this process, the, uh, the efficiency of energy transfer, is very steeply dependent on the distance between the donor and the acceptor. And so if they're far apart, it's like in the unfolded state, so this protein is in equilibrium between an unfolded and unfolded, uh, and a folded state. And so in the unfolded state, the distance is quite large and then the energy transfer is, uh, is quite inefficient. And in the folded state, they come closer together. And so then we have a high efficiency of, of energy transfer. And so this is uh, really in a very useful uh, molecular scale, usually in the, in the order of about one to 10 nanometers. And using the transfer efficiency, we can really uh, calculate the distance between the two dyes. And so this really acts as a, as a molecular ruler. And all we have to do is, is uh, to, to measure the, the transfer efficiency is to count the number of acceptor photons and the number of donor photons. And how do we do this in practice? Well, we actually uh, need a confocal microscope, such as the Microtime 200 that we use uh, from PicoQuant. And uh, combined with the fact that uh, we can make a very small confocal volume, so we have here an objective, we have a cover slide, and our sample is here that, that has uh, fluorescently labeled proteins. So when we have a very small confocal volume uh, and we combine it with the fact that we use very, very low concentrations of, of proteins, uh, we ensure that at any given time, there's only one protein in the confocal volume. And so uh, uh, once in a while, uh, a protein will diffuse through the confocal volume and, and get excited and emit the fluorescence photon multiple times before it exits again. And so if we just uh, look at the photon counts over time, we'll see uh, that besides sort of the fluorescent background, we'll get these bursts of fluorescence photons that you can see here. And each one of these bursts is a single protein molecule that's diffusing through the, through the focus. And so what we can do is we can take every one of these single molecule bursts and calculate a transfer efficiency. And, and usually we, we will put this in a, in a sort of a histogram. And immediately from this, you can see that we can separate at equilibrium the signal from the unfolded and the folded molecules, and then we can analyze them separately. And if we're lucky enough to have pulsed excitation, we can also get information on timing statistics of the photons, and, and then we have access to lifetimes, so and we can do, we can extract a lot more information. And so we used uh, these methods. Uh, I, I did this in Zurich uh, when I was a postdoc with Ben Schuler. We worked uh, a lot on these uh, with these methods on intrinsically disordered proteins. And this is sort of what I'm continuing on here in Iceland. And there we studied very uh, heavily disordered proteins. So histone H1 has a small collaborator domain that you can see here. And it's flanked by these long intrinsically disordered regions. And it's very positively charged. And we were studying the interaction to prothymosin alpha, which is its chaperone. And this is a very negatively charged and very disordered protein. And so I just want to boil down really uh, what the, the story was that we published a few years ago, where we used the combination of single molecule FRED, NMR, and simulations to, to show really that the complex between these two proteins is really, really disordered. So they don't have any fixed really uh, structure in the complex, but they bind really tightly together in the picomolar range. And so this prompted us to ask the question, uh, what is the functional advantage of such a complex and why does it really need to be so disordered? And in order to answer that, we, we sort of need to take a look at what, what is the function of these proteins. 
Histone H1 binds nucleosomes. Uh, and so you can see here a structure of the nucleosome, uh, and, and you can see that the globular domain sits here on the dyad. And we don't know, we, I mean, in the structure, you don't resolve the conformations of these vast uh, disordered regions. But when histone H1 binds to the nucleosome, it sort of collapses these linkers that connect the adjacent nucleosomes. And this leads to a global collapse of the chromatin fiber, so you get this, this condensed uh, chromatin. And so really what we wanted to start with doing was to understand what are the conformations of the disordered regions on the nucleosome. And, and to do that, we used single mole to Fred. And uh, we really mapped the histone H1 nucleosome complex very thoroughly uh, using FRET. And we did that by placing a donor dye in any one of six positions along the sequence of, of histone H1, uh, really probing the entire polypeptide. And we placed an acceptor dye in any one of eight positions along the nucleosome structure from the linkers to the core. And then we measured FRET between all of these labeling pairs. And what we end up with is this sort of a distance grid. So we can convert the transfer efficiencies to distances. And just to summarize what we see from this complex picture actually is that qualitatively, we can already say from this that, that uh, histone H1, the disordered regions don't really uh, have a fixed structure, but rather they sample a very broad distribution of, of distances uh, in a dynamic manner. So we turn to simulations. Uh, and so we used coarse grain simulations to try to simulate uh, the, the complex and see uh, really to get a, a sort of a molecular picture of what it looks like. And I, I don't really have time to go into the details of this model. I mean, we essentially treat the entire system uh, as a string of beads to simplify things. So it's, it's a very coarse grained model, but a very simple model that, that uh, really is dominated by charges is able to reproduce the FRET efficiencies uh, from the experiments that you see in blue and uh, the, the simulation that, that is in gray really uh, reproduces the pattern and the absolute FRET efficiencies of all these labeling positions that you see here on the X uh, axis. And so what does the simulation look like? Uh, it looks a little bit like this. This is about a microsecond uh, that is condensed into about a minute. And what we can see is that histone H1 is really, really disordered and dynamic on the nucleosome. We see the globular domain that sits here on the dyad, as it should. And uh, the, the disordered regions really sample a very, very broad distribution of distances. And so the other thing that came out of this when we did our binding studies is that the resonance time of H1 on the nucleosome was in the order of hours. And this was really incompatible with efficient um, uh, regulation in vivo, and we already know in vivo that the resonance time is in the order of minutes. And so we suspected that the chaperone that I told you about, prothymus and alpha, may have something to do with uh, reducing this resonance time. And so we did, or we turned to uh, experiments on the surface. And so here we immobilize uh, nucleosomes on the surface, and they are fluorescently labeled with the donor and acceptor. And uh, we have H1, which is here in blue, freely diffusing in the solution. And so when you bind H1 to the nucleosome, it collapses these linkers, bringing the, the dyes close together, and then you have high threat. And then when, when uh, H1 is unbound, the, the sort of linkers come apart, and uh, then you have lower threat. And so if you look at the fluorescence over time, you see that, that the acceptor fluorescence is higher most of the time, indicating that it's bound. And then you have these occasional dissociation events. And then we just add prothymus and alpha to the mix and see what happens to the kinetics. And when we do that, and even just at low micromolar amounts, we see that the frequency of the events, these dissociation events increases, and it increases even further when we go up to about 100 micromolar, all, all the way to the point where we see mostly the unbound state. So obviously prothymus is, is uh, doing something here. And when we plot these rates as a function of prothymus and concentration, we can see that the data actually is, is only consistent with a model that involves a ternary complex, meaning that prothymus and alpha invades and forms a ternary complex to really enhance the dissociation of H1 from the nucleosome. And so we can also add prothymus into a similar coarse grain simulation and show that it indeed does bind uh, histone H1 on the nucleosome and it enhances uh, the, the uh, dissociation of it from the nucleosome, which is very consistent with the kinetics that we measure in our single molecule FRET experiments. And so this order really enables an acceleration of H1 dissociation from the nucleosome by almost two orders of magnitude. So that's quite, quite a big effect, which can explain in part why, uh, why the uh, resonance times in vivo could be uh, so short, because you have chaperones and you have all kinds of other things that actually 
take part. And so uh, I just want to leave you with, with key points. I mean, that was an example of how we can use single molecule threat to tackle very complex problems. Um, single molecule spectroscopy is a really powerful technique to study distances and dynamics of biomolecules. Um, it enables access actually to molecular timescales to span over 15 orders of magnitude. So the experimental toolbox is very, very large. We have correlation spectroscopy and, and the kinetics and microfluidics and all kinds of things that we can do to, to study different molecular timescales. Uh, I've shown you that it's actually ideally suited to study the interactions of disordered proteins with chromatin, and this is what we're doing here in Iceland, taking these concepts a little bit further. And I showed you specifically that that single molecule threat really revealed that the release of linker histone H1 is driven by a polyelectrolyte competition with a, with a disordered chaperone. And uh, with that, I'd just like to acknowledge, I mean, this was uh, most, all of this work was done with Ben Schuler uh, in Zurich, David de Mercadante and Robert Best did some of the simulations and all of these people came into this in one way or another uh, in, in very uh, uh, challenging work. Uh, and these are the funding agencies and thank you for your attention. Excellent, thanks very much, Peter. Uh, so now I think uh, we can welcome questions for all the speakers uh, and so if you have a question and you haven't done so already please type it in the question box as shown in the image uh, on the screen and in fact uh, let me just unhook them we have two questions already from one very uh, active member uh, of the audience. So, George, I think we're going to go with you first. <laughs> so, the question okay. is from Deb. Uh, and Deb asks, in the single molecule replication reaction, how far the protein molecules should stay with respect to each other on the DNA strand in order to capture them as individual molecules in the TERF microscope? So okay, I think it's question. a solution question, yeah. Yeah, so the um, the molecule is about 50,000 base pairs per lambda DNA, um, and I think each pixel in the microscope is about 500 base pairs, so um, you can only really distinguish proteins that are that over 500 base pairs and more like over 5,000 base pairs apart, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So now let's move to Sonia. Um, so that's also a question from Deb. Thanks very much, Deb. <laughs> uh, so the question, can NeoTrap be used to study sequential multiple protein-protein interactions by adjusting the diameter of the nanopore? Well, here I guess I would have, first of all, thanks for the question. Uh, I would have a, a return question. I'm not sure if that works. But, uh, um, what is meant with uh, sequential in situ, I guess, is uh, is the question. So for the size of the nanopore can be tuned within, well, at some point we would have to uh, make a bigger DNA origami uh, sphere um, uh, than we have right now. Right now the sphere is uh, 35 nanometers in diameter and we worked with what we did already so far was we worked with uh, nanopore diameters of up to um, 30 nanometers and there's always a, a coating so this ends up being a 20 nanometer uh, coated pore um, uh, the the interactions could be sequentially detected if they lead to uh, distinguishable signals. And this is something that is very difficult to, um, to predict beforehand. So that's actually quite often in these nanopore experiments. It's different from, for example, FRET uh, spectroscopy, where you, where you know what kind of distance uh, dependence you can expect and, and how this will uh, be reflected in your data. That is a bit, uh, it's often more complicated in, in the uh, nanopore data. So what people usually do is they build up their um, experiments in a systematic way, just adding first one analyte, then a second analyte, uh, a third analyte, and um, to see which interactions occur then that were not visible beforehand. And like this, you can infer where the, where the signals come from. So I cannot give such a generalized uh, answer. I think there can be situations where this is possible. Um, that I think is as good as I can answer. 
Excellent, thank you very much. Can I just ask uh, Sangamesh, who asked a question, uh, to uh, perhaps indicate who this question is addressed to, so that I can ask it later, and in the meantime, I'll probably follow up with the question to Peter. <laughs> uh, so, um, so I actually want to ask, because that's very intriguing, um, and I guess this is the first fuzzy complex <laughs> that I can uh, truly believe in. Um, but I have a question uh, with the nucleosomes experiments. Have you tried to do these, and I know they're very difficult, uh, in the context of dinucleosomes? And how, what would happen then uh, with the H1 binding and that's a very good question. Uh, and actually, <clears throat> we sort of flirted with these, uh, these experiments, and, but we took it a little bit more, you know, further than a dinucleosome. We actually went straight for a 12-mer. We went from the mm -hmm. mononucleosome and then we thought, well, let's just, you know, go all the way and, and just go big. And then we went for a 12-mer. But uh, as you said, I mean, these are, this is really technically demanding and especially with H1 because it doesn't, I mean, so it doesn't really have a specific binding site, so it will just bind to, to all of these regions. And on the single molecule level, this can be quite difficult to decipher. But what I can say is that we, we did manage to do uh, some tricks to at least show, and this is not in, in, as part of the paper or anything that, that, we, that we are, that it's coming out now soon, but um, we did show that the overall dimensions of the disordered regions is the same in a 12-mer even when it's compacted by, by uh, sort of, you know, when you have many unlabeled also H1s in there, but the disordered regions essentially have the same dimensions, which I mean, is in a way surprising actually, because you have a completely different environment. But I think the, the reason is that, that you know, um, that even in the mononucleosome, you have enough DNA there to really saturate the, the contacts of all these sort of electrostatics that are going on. And so adding more DNA to that doesn't really make a difference to the overall dimensions. And so this, this becomes kind of like a, like an electron cloud in a sense. Uh, but yeah, we did flirt with that, uh, but we never got far, unfortunately. But this is, a, this is entirely what I'm trying to do uh, more of here. So moving into bigger systems and, and looking at sort of di, tri, tetramers, tromers and, and beyond. Okay, excellent. I have lots of more questions to all of you, actually, but I'm going to crack on. So, uh, so Sangamesh actually came back saying that that was the question for you, Peter. And so the question is, how about tracking changes in orientations along with the distance? Um, tracking changes in orientation. So you mean then, I mean, so what? one of the things that we did, which we can do, well, we did with the simulations, um, which is to look at um, how the globular domain sits on the nucleosome. Maybe that's what you're what you're talking about. I hope, hope that's what, what it is, because essentially in our experiments, you're probably right about this, that we can't discern whether it's it's turned uh, uh, sort of this way or 180 degrees on the nucleosome on the dyad. But we did see indications in our histograms that that uh, we saw this as well, because we, we would see in some labeling positions evidence for this. And when we did the simulation, we essentially used the crystal structure of, of the nucleosome. But then what David did was to, to do 180 degree of the of the uh, of the globular domain, and then he could actually reproduce some of those additional uh, populations that popped up. And so we couldn't really quantify uh, how much was in each orientation, but I actually think that generally speaking, they were almost equal. Um, but but we didn't really go more into this. Um, but sure, there are, of course, other labeling um, strategies that you, you could go through to, to really pinpoint what these orientations are. Yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. Okay, so can I ask a question now from myself <laughs> to Sonia, actually? So in the, um, the protein nanopore experiment, the protein sequencing sort of, what is the length of the readout? How long can they go for? Because I haven't seen these papers. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, indeed, that's limited, right? Because they still uh, rely on uh, processing of the yeah. DNA. Um, the DNA. Um, if I remember correctly, it was, um, up to, I saw a sequence up to uh, 15 uh, amino acids, okay. which actually sounds okay. quite long, um, but uh, but but definitely will be possible. So th this um, will be 
will remain a limitation for that uh, experiment, but what is already done also in, in today's um, uh, peptide sequencing is that uh, people rely on the overlapping uh, sequences, right? That you then can um, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, add together the, the bits and pieces and uh, resolve the entire sequence of, an, of a protein. I guess this is what people now uh, have as a next uh, goal to, to really uh, um, yeah, go far beyond this lim uh, limitation of these very first um, experiments that are now published. Excellent. Okay. And last question for George from me. <laughs> uh, so, how do you think, and I, I know I, I must have asked you this question before, uh, but how do you think RTL and FunkJ actually uh, drive the eviction of MCMs? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, um, I think, yeah, well, I think a, a model I'm quite, um, I quite like is maybe um, these these helicases acting on the other side of the replication port could help sort of pull the pull the DNA actually maybe could, uh, through one of the um, interfaces between the MCM. Um, hexamers like between the subunits in a single hexamer and that could help mm -hmm. uh, remove it from the DNA and I think that could be that wouldn't happen with CMG because we sort of know that CMG isn't um, a, a very strong helicase whereas the helicases um, mm -hmm. might be stronger and would allow that um, I mean the other thing is maybe if they're sort of um, if you imagine all of my diagrams are showing just like naked DNAs and if a double hexamer is sliding on a naked DNA, that's not really happening. There's nucleosomes and other DNA binding proteins present. So maybe kind of helping push against something that's already bound to the DNA could mm -hmm. cause them to collapse. But I guess what we do know is you do need you, something strong and active needs to happen because we know that these double hexamer complexes are quite stable. You can add half molar salt to them on DNA and they will remain on DNA. So um, yeah, something. Active. Yeah, something along those lines. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. One last question. Quick questions. To, question to Peter. Um, why does SM thread is better suited for disordered proteins with chromatin? Why chromatin? Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a you know uh, that's also a fuzzy answer actually because uh, why I say it's ideally suited is is essentially because. Science-wise, I mean, there aren't so many methods that actually are great for studying disorder. I mean, disorder proteins are really, as I said in the beginning, like a major challenge. I mean, it's really challenging to understand them. And so one very powerful method is NMR that gives you really high resolution information. But then the size of the system becomes uh, difficult. You know, if you so there's a group, of course, that does so Huko van Inkel does uh, nucleosome work uh, and uh, and on uh, the histones, and he's done some uh, beautiful work. But when you want to increase the size a little bit further, then, then NMR becomes quite difficult. And I think um, we have uh, a lot of potential using the fluorescent strategies that we have to really look at big targets, you know, look at uh, really nucleosome arrays uh, and to get and to use sort of the single molecule fluorescence techniques that we have to build really accurate models actually of what's happening. And so I, I think in terms of chromatin, I'm not saying single molecule threat necessarily, but single molecule techniques in general, would be very, very, very powerful to study disordered interactions with, with chromatin in that respect, I think, yeah. Excellent, okay, well, thank you very much. And I think, uh, given that we just want to run out of time, uh, I think I would like to thank all the speakers one more time for a great scientific session. Uh, and of course, I would like to thank Pico Kwan for sponsoring this webinar. Uh, I also want to thank the Biochemical Society events team uh, for the work behind the scenes. Um, and my special thanks go to Sandra, uh, who has made this event happen and made sure that uh, everything ran smoothly for everyone. And, and of course, finally, I would like to thank our audience uh, for joining us today and being engaged and asking questions. Uh, you can, of course, continue the conversation online uh, by following the Biochemical Society and Portland Press on Twitter. 
Uh, also, you can find more information about careers, including career profiles and job seeking advice uh, on our website. Uh, you can also find some day in the life career profiles on the Biochemist webpage. Uh, of course, we welcome suggestions for future topics and speakers to feature in our Biochemistry Focus webinar series. So, if you have an idea for a webinar in 2022, we invite you to submit a proposal for an upcoming webinar. Now, if you have missed any of the 40 plus webinars uh, that we've run as part of the series uh, or would like to watch them again, uh, please visit our website or YouTube channel. Uh, and the recording from today's webinar will also be available to watch, uh, hopefully within the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, so you can find more information about the webinars, how to propose your webinar and watch previous recording on biochemistry.org slash webinars. So please join us for the next webinar in the series entitled Environmental Sustain Sustainability in Biomedical Laboratories on Wednesday 24th of November at 2 p.m. GMT. Uh, during this session, uh, chaired by Dr. Ben Foster at the University of Oxford, uh, we will hear an introduction to the LEAF platform, uh, followed by a talk from the sustainability team in Oxford about setting up local infrastructure for sustainable labs uh, and the lab manager directly involved in carrying out sustainable labs initiatives. So finally, I'd like to highlight that uh, in these challenging times, uh, it's more important than ever to stay connected and engage with your fellow molecular bioscientists. Uh, it's an extraordinary time for us, but also uh, it's an exciting time to join the Biochemical Society uh, and our community to stay connected and take advantage of key benefits, which include discounted registration fees for society courses and meetings, exclusive access to a wide range of grants and bursaries, personal online access to two of their journal and many, many more. Uh, and so please visit the Biochemi Biochemical Society website to find out more about it. Uh, and finally, thank you very much from me and goodbye. <laughs>